It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. Hello there, this is Phil Ferguson, and you have joined me for the Phil Ferguson Show. I am so delighted you could make it. Today we have some good, fun stuff coming up. Our interview is with Martina Fern, and she works for the Center for Inquiry, and we talk about the Center for Inquiry, and we talk about their upcoming convention, SciCon. So hopefully you can make it. We're doing this in very early October and I'm doing this actually on the 2nd of October, and in two days I go to Women of Color Beyond Belief, so in case you hear this right away, you can come join us in Chicago, but the next event I'm going to is in uh, Las Vegas, it's the uh, SciCon conference, and we're going to talk all about that with Martina. The uh, Investing Skeptically segment today is going to be about index funds and Michael Burry. He is one of the people that correctly predicted the collapse of the housing market back in 2008, and he was a predominant figure in uh, the big short book and movie, and he has some things to say about index funds, but I don't want to spoil all of that for you. That will be coming up a little later on. Right now, I want to go over a little bit about my trip. I went to Italy. And going to Italy is is great fun. Uh, and we went to a different region, a region we've never been to before called Calabria. And it's just so amazing, so beautiful. It actually, according to locals that we talked to and our guides, it has the most number of miles of coast because it's the toe of the boot and it goes, you know, way down all the way to Sicily and it's got water on one side and then on the other side, it has a incredible amount of coastline. So plenty of beautiful places to see. Uh, cities that are on the coast, down low, just a few feet above the water, and cities up on cliffs. So many, many things to see. Uh, another thing that was unique about this vacation for my wife and I, it was the first lar- large, I can't speak English, large group tour that we took. It was about 120, 125 people in two large coach buses. And sometimes there was a a third van for an entire family that came together and wanted to stay together and they had a van. And with this type of vacation, there's pluses and minuses. One of the pluses, absolutely phenomenally affordable. The entire two-week vacation, including virtually every bit of food you could ever want and probably often more than you want, all the hotel, all the transportation, including the airfare to and from Chicago to Rome nonstop. All of that, I think it was $3,300. Another unique thing about this uh, trip is that it's put on by the Calabresi in America organization or Chow, which is very clever, very clever. And so a lot of people on the trip are from Calabria, I mean, including people that were literally born there, uh, sometimes as children, and their families left or immigrated back to the United States. Uh, So that was fascinating to get their experience and their reaction. And every once in a while, the bus would go by a city where somebody or a couple of people were born in. And that level of excitement, I can't can't get without a trip like that. So that's very cool. The other thing that's a huge perk is that everything's planned out. Now, that can also be a big negative, depending on you and your style and what you want and where you're planning to go. But we went to amazing places day after day. I think it was, we had one day off maybe where we weren't traveling somewhere. So we got to see an amazing amount of stuff in a very short period of time. 
Now, some of the downsides is you're on a bus <laughs> and you're on a bus a lot. And matter of fact, one of the cities we went to was over three hours away by car. And of course, in a bus, you have to have a stop or two because when you have 120 people, somebody has to go to the bathroom. So it takes even longer to have a couple of stops to get there. And a couple of the places we drove three to four hours to get there and you have three or four hours there and then three or four hours back. And so you have a 10 to 12 hour day where half to two thirds of it was sitting on the bus. And sometimes the place that we get to, they have a lunch for two hours, which if you're really in the food and you're really into sitting and eating for a long period of time, you will be incredibly happy. I would actually rather just grab a one and a half euro slice of pizza, eat it while I'm walking and see more things. But that's not the kind of trip that it was. And I knew that going in. So it's all cool. Um, we went as far south as a city called Tropea. And that's uh, probably three quarters of the way down on the west side. Everything we did was on the west side, except for one or two things in the middle. And we went to the city of Tropea. And it is a city on a cliff. So it, you know, big cliffs drop down and then there's a flat area, which is mostly reserved for uh, a nice big road and beaches. Beautiful, beautiful sand beaches. And Tropea has the interesting thing that it's a very big tourist town and the vast majority of tourists there are German. Don't know how it came to be that way, but it was German. We, we stopped at a restaurant, I think it was called the, the Genius Bar or the Genius Restaurant, and it was had this wall where you could sit, and we did. We sat right on this wall and looking over the cliff at the sea and the beaches down below. Absolutely amazing. And the price was incredibly affordable, and in part because um, Calabria is the lowest income and the poorest region of all of Italy. Sicily is next closest or third or something like that from the bottom. So the average wages are low. And it also means a lot of the costs are low. So if you want a a place that you can go into Italy and see natural beauty beyond compare, um, Calabria is a great place to go. And it's not even that expensive. Uh, so we went to Tro Tropea. And on the way back, we stopped in a, a city called Pizzo, which is also kind of on a, a little bit of a cliff, but it's a very small space where the city is built and very compact, but they had a nice piazza and the city of Pizzo, which is spelled like pizza with an O instead of an A, Pizzo. They have a famous ice cream called Tartufo and Tartufo generally means truffle. And instead of being a candy or a chocolatey truffle, it is was a ice cream truffle and it, it basically a little bit bigger than a baseball, not quite as big as a uh, softball ice cream and it had more ice cream inside. So it was a ball of ice cream with ice cream inside. I don't know how they make it. As far as I'm concerned, it's magic. I got the classic version, which was chocolate and then inside was dark chocolate and hazelnut gelato. So absolutely amazing. Very good to see. And of course, a beautiful city, uh, of course, the un unfortunate part, we were only there for about an hour, maybe hour and 15, because it's pretty far south and we had to take the bus all the way back up. We went into the mountains one day and we went to a, a place that is a ski resort because even though it's incredibly far south, there are a ton of mountains in Calabria. I guess I never studied or looked it up before. I had no idea. And of course, that is also a downside because transportation is quite a bit of difficulty, especially when you're in a bus with 60 people and the drivers that we had, magicians, absolutely. These switchbacks on these narrow roads uh, and you go a couple feet too far on one side, you're going through the guardrail down to your doom and a few inches too far on the other side and you're scraping the bus somehow on uh, a building or a cliff face absolutely amazing how they were able to take those corners. Uh, I would have done it in a car or could have done it in a car, but I'm glad I didn't have to do the driving because it was pretty intense and also uh, got to spend pretty much an entire day at a, an estate. Uh, one of the uh, organizers, the person that runs it from Chicago, his family is from there and his family, a lot of his family is still there. So we went to this estate and they had 
live music and food, like 20, 30, 40 different things to choose from. Absolutely amazing. And I'm very delighted that they are so kind to open up their house and, and let so many people in. We also went to another mountain uh, city called Alto Monte, which means high mountain. Very clever, right? And I don't know, because some of these places they get, apparently get a lot of snow in the winter. So they're very happy to have uh, some warm weather when we were there. The place we stayed uh, was called the um, Santa Catarina Village. They, that's what they told me. That's how to pronounce village, village. Santa Catarina Village in the city of Scalea, S-C-A-L-E-A, if you want to look it up. A small city, but this hotel slash resort was amazing. It had tennis courts. It had access to its own piece of the beach and umbrellas you could rent. It had a pool. It had an area where there was a DJ at night and a dance floor. They even had a outdoor theater with plastic seats, like 500 seats where they could put on shows. And we actually saw a local version, an Italian version of uh, Mamma Mia, the ABBA movie. It was much truncated and, and young actors and actresses doing that. Had a great time with that. One of the other things that was weird here, uh, in previous trips, I would use what I call Team T-I-M. It's a cell phone network in Italy and other countries. And I would go get a SIM card and put it in my Wi-Fi device and have uh, quite a bit of data so that I'm not using the hotel or anyone else's Wi-Fi. I'm using my own Wi-Fi that no one else can get onto, and it goes straight to the cell phone tower. And so that provides an extra layer of protection and security for me, my devices, my computer, and for clients. Because while I'm away, I still do some work. I try to limit it, and a lot of clients are very cool and saying, yeah, talk to me when you get back. And of course, before I left, I tried to make sure everybody was happy and all of my work for September was done, which was a lot of hours before we left. And I'm still doing some catch up, but that's okay. But there was no team store, Tim store in Scalea. So I had to get a Vodafone SIM and had to go to the store three or four times. Finally ended up buying their device before I got it to work. And even then it was incredibly slow in our room. Uh, so a couple times I had to go down to the lobby or, or uh, sit outside, which was awesome, by the way, but you know, sit outside and do work because that's where I could get uh, the signal. We also had an entire day around, I guess half a day around the island. It's called Dino, uh, Lisa Dino, Dino Island, Island of Dino. Again, you know, on a boat. Absolutely fantastic. We took a little break at a little cute private beach, I guess, or, or hard to get to beach and swam in the Mediterranean for uh, an hour. Again, great fun. And we went a little far north out of Calabria to a city called um, Mara Maratea, Maratea, yeah, M-A-R-A-T-E-A, -A -E Maratea. And there is a statue of Jesus there. So, you know, it was pretty cool to go see. It's like the one outside of Rio, but much smaller, still huge, but much smaller. And, you know, got to see that very famous site in that city. And a lot of the people on the group were very religious, very Catholic, because they're Italians from Calabria. That's just kind of how it goes. The other thing that I was kind of surprised by is it was my intent to not talk about religion for sure, because we were kind of going on their trip as a kind of a pilgrimage to this uh, statue and to some churches, and we didn't want to cause any trouble. I don't want to be the problem. Um, and I also didn't want to talk politics. <laughs> Uh, but it came up a couple of different times and I held my tongue in the last day. I wasn't sure I could do it anymore, but I, I did. Uh, but we would be sitting at lunch or dinner or at a cafe having a, an espresso. And suddenly out of the blue, someone you're talking to says, I just want to let you know that I love Trump. <laughs> and it's just the most bizarre thing uh, to me that that would just kind of come up out of the blue and uh, we, one of the uh, one of the days we were traveling, they they couldn't uh, get Fox News, so uh, they were complaining about that, which was hysterical. I thought it was hysterical, but anyway, the people we traveled with were delightful, and some of them promised they were going to listen to this show. So 
Uh, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. I did warn them that I talk about politics and religion and money. So you know, the three things you should not discuss with your family, or maybe you should, but people often don't. Anyway, wrapping that up, that, that's some information about uh, my trip to Italy. I don't have anything planned to Italy at this time. I've been to almost every region, uh, definitely not Sicily and definitely not uh, Sardinia. So I've got to figure out how to get to those at some point in the future. But, you know, if you have any questions about uh, traveling to Italy specifically or, or traveling in general and you want some tips, let me know. Our, our previous trip, my wife and I had spent three and a half weeks and the only thing we had was the backpack and each, we each had a backpack and we each had a 21 inch roller bag that you could put overhead in the airplane. And we did three and a half weeks that way. It's really kind of fun because you can be quite mobile. So one of the things we'd like to do is stay somewhere for three or four days and then hop on the train and go another three or four days. Um, oh, I almost forgot. That's another thing that is kind of a problem in Calabria as far as economics because of the continuous mountains everywhere. Uh, train tracks and and roads are really difficult to build and expensive to build because you have a tunnel and then you have a giant bridge. Maybe that's 200 feet high. And then you have another tunnel and then another giant bridge. So you have to build all these bridges. You have to dig all these tunnels somehow. And it's just very hard, very, very time consuming. Not necessarily hard now because there's roads, but very time consuming to move from one place to another, which hurts economic development. Uh, something we generally don't have uh, trouble with in the United States, except for a few places where it's very mountainous, but this whole region was mountainous. So that, that added to the joy. Anyway, uh, right after a quick break, we're going to talk about index funds and Michael Burry's opinions of them. And then after that, Martina Fern talking about Psy Con Conference in Las Vegas in just a few days. But there was one performance this year that stunned me. It, it sank its hooks in my heart. Not because it was good. It was, there was nothing good about it. But it was effective and it did its job. It made its intended audience laugh and show their teeth. It was that moment when the person asking to sit in the most respected seat in our country imitated a disabled reporter, someone he outranked in privilege, power, and the capacity to fight back. It kind of broke my heart when I saw it, and I still can't get it out of my head because it wasn't in a movie. It was real life. And this instinct to humiliate when it's modeled by someone on the public platform, by someone powerful, it filters down into everybody's life because it kind of gives permission for other people to do the same thing. Disrespect invites disrespect. Violence incites violence. When the powerful use their position to bully others, we all lose. Okay, go up with that thing. Okay, this brings me to the press. We need the principled press to hold power to account, to, to call them on the carpet for every outrage. All right, next up I have a segment involving... Michael Burry, in case you don't know who he is, he is one of the people that saw the coming bubble of uh, home loans in 2008. He was uh, featured in the very fun movie, The Big Short, of course, uh, after the book called The Big Short. And I can recommend both the book and the movie when you can find a movie that's fun and entertaining and talks about finance. Um, uh, that's kind of cool. So I uh, recommend all that stuff. And of course, he was one of the people that was a hero in that movie. And he has now come out and he's expressed concerns. Um, and let's see, I think I, I think this is a quote. They've got the quote fucked up on this website. I'm looking at Barron's. But I think this is the quote. The bubble is passive investing through ETFs and index funds, as well as the trend to very large size 
among asset managers has orphaned small value type securities globally. Not 100% sure that's right because it doesn't sound like a coherent sentence. But I think what he's talking about is a couple of things. One, other things that are, are written about this and I've read in other places, I'm not sure he really gets index funds. So that's the first thing. Uh, the other thing, of course, is just because you're right about something 11 years ago doesn't mean you're right about something else now. But, you know, he's a pretty smart guy. So let's take a look at this. Now, he's talking about uh, index funds. And part of what he's talking about, I think I'm going to agree with him a little bit. Uh, he's talking about uh, over investment of large and particularly growth stocks. And I agree with that. And we've talked about that on the show where uh, some people have shown me their portfolios and this may be something that you have done inadvertently as long as large cap and particularly large cap growth does so phenomenally well. So many mutual fund managers are kind of stuck and they don't want to go against the grain because if 2020, 2021 is another year where large cap growth beats out everything else. If your fund doesn't hold those kinds of stocks, you fall behind and you look bad and maybe your job's at risk or your mutual fund company can't sell as many units of the fund, whether it's an index fund or a managed fund or an ETF. So his concern about passive versus active is complete bullshit. There's nothing there as far as what he's talking about. But the concentration of uh, hot money chasing, and this is one of those things that uh, uh, often in the investment world is called momentum investing. And the idea is that you invest in what's hot because what has been hot will be hot and will continue to be hot. And I add on the additional phrase until it's not. And often the hottest thing becomes the most not hot thing when the momentum changes the other direction. And of course, that's a whole nother game about trying to do momentum stuff. But it's something that I've been looking at and for a couple of years now, shying away from large cap uh, compared to a market neutral position and shying away from growth in general, uh, large, mid and even small cap by some measured amounts so that we're reducing our risk. Whereas I've also had people uh, send me their portfolios and they have five or eight different mutual funds. And when I pull up those five or dif eight different mutual funds on morningstar.com, which you can do, of course, morningstar.com, and you find what are the biggest stocks, they all have the same handful of stocks, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, uh, you know, the regular list of the companies that we all know and love. And if you bought them 10 years ago, you've made a killing. But if you own them today, are they going to beat the market index going forward? Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. Uh, it's hard to know which stocks will win going forward. It's easy to see who won in the past because we have that data. So if he's talking about the concentration and perhaps the over-concentration in large cap and the over-concentration in growth versus value, I agree. But the idea that it's caused by index funds is fallacious because when a stock leaves the S&P 500 because it's not growing as fast as the others or it's shrinking or it's split, it falls off the list for the S&P 500, but then it becomes a mid-cap stock. And there's index funds for mid-cap stocks, mid-cap value, mid-cap growth. And if it becomes too small for that, it goes to small cap. You can also do micro cap, but... I don't like fishing down there. Uh, and of course, there's also index funds for different seg sectors, different segments. There's the total stock market index fund, which owns it, whether it's a large cap or a small cap. And so it's not like everyone's buying the same 30 stocks like has happened in the past where people get really excited about the Dow and they're only buying those 30 stocks. And when the mood changes and people don't want to own those 30 stocks or back in the 60s, the nifty 50, there were 50 stocks that all the money went into until it didn't. Uh, this is something that has happened again and again. So 
if all of your stocks are in the U.S., and if all of your U.S. stocks are in large cap growth, I would be very concerned for you. But the way I'm doing it right now, and I just talked about this for asset allocation, uh, we're talking about something like 28% of the U.S. part being in large cap growth. And if you have 20 or 25% international, um, you know, you're looking at something around 20, 21% in large cap growth. So if that segment gets whacked extra hard, you're going to feel it, but you're not going to be 80 or 90% in that segment. So that's a little update of the, the big news item uh, from Michael Burry, again, uh, featured in the big short and correctly identified problems with uh, home loan financing and all the complexities that were there. Um, but I think he's partially right that people have been overexcited about large cap and large cap growth, but it has nothing to do with passive investing and or index funds. And that's just my thoughts on it. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Your investments should be based on your situation, and you should consult with your financial advisor before taking any action. The show may contain ads. These ads are placed into the show by the hosting company after I finish recording and editing. I have little control over the content of the ads, and you should not assume that I support their products or claims. If you choose to support the show via the new Patreon page, that support does not create an advisor-client relationship. Behold the atheist's nightmare. Now, if you study a well-made banana, you'll find on the far side there are three ridges. On the close side, two ridges. If you get your hand ready to grip a banana, you'll find on the far side there are three grooves. On the close side, two grooves. The banana and the hand are perfectly made one for the other. You'll find the maker of the banana, Almighty God, has made it with a non-slip surface. It has outward indicators of inward contents. Green, too early. Yellow, just right. Black, too late. Now, if you go to the top of the banana, you'll find, as with the soda can makers, they placed a tab at the top. So God has placed a tab at the top. When you pull the tab, the contents don't squirt in your face. You'll find the wrapper, which is biodegradable, has perforations. Notice how gracefully it sits over the human hand. Notice it has a point at the top for ease of entry. It's just the right shape for the human mouth. It's chewy, easy to digest, and it's even curved toward the face to make the whole process so much easier. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Okay, everybody, we're going to continue on with the show. And as promised, I have a very special guest for you today. With me is Martina Fern, and she is the Vice President for Philanthropy at the Center for Inquiry. Martina, how are you today? Hi, Phil. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I'm delighted to have you. And, and as I'm reading this title one more time, Vice President for Philanthropy, why not Vice President of Philanthropy? Uh, it's a it's a proactive sort of thing. I'm all for philanthropy. Uh-huh. Uh, it's like really that. just a fancy way of saying I'm not ashamed to beg people for money <laughs> when it when it's a good cause anyway. Yeah, I, a lot of organizations call it. I think they call it development or something like that. But uh, yeah, but I always thought that was confusing because we don't build anything. Uh, you know? Fair, fair enough, fair enough. And uh, apparently, you've talked me and the Phil Ferguson show into something. What what did I agree to do? We don't need the dollars, but you, just in principle. You agreed to have me on, first of all. That was my biggest coup. Yay. But uh, another big coup is that you are sponsoring our Skeptics Conference, PsyCon, in Las Vegas next month. I, I am so excited. And I don't know if you knew, but I'm going to sneak in my own little event at the conference. And oh, my, no, I did not know that. Tell me about it. My uh, regular listeners know, but on Thursday, after the workshops because I don't want to interfere with anything that you guys are doing. We're going to go, and mm-hmm. you could join us, of course. You feel free to. And matter of fact, you would be my guest. Everyone else has to pay their own way, but you could be my guest. Oh, we're going to go. Count me in. We're going to go over the sky bridge to the south to the little mall area that's right in front of Bally's, and we're going to go to Wahlburger and, and get some oh. food. And it, it might be me and you. It, I mean, it might be three of us, but it might be 40 people. I, I don't know. I don't know yet. We'll go over to Wahlburger 
And then when we, after we get some food in our bellies, we're going to turn around because right across from Wahlburger is the Fuel Bar, which is for many years in a row, the best bar in Vegas. And they throw bottles and make these fancy foo-foo drinks. And they often have, uh, actually, wait a second. I have these from my last trip right here. You, you, you hear that? That, that? That's the sound of uh-huh. cards. Uh, buy one, get one free drink uh, at the Fuel Bar. So, Oh, sweet. We're, we're going to do that, which you might not be able to because when we're done, we're going to go back just in time for the opening ceremony on Thursday. Well, yeah, I can be a little, you know. Yeah, maybe you came over for some food. up and, from, from the yeah. trip. No, that's all well, good. Well, some people that might. That sounds fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, some people might have to do uh you know, buy one, get one free. They, the two people can share the two drinks because they they aren't kidding around <laughs> with these drinks. But, uh, yeah, so like you said, uh, the Phil Ferguson Show is an official sponsor for Center for Inquiries Conference, SciCon. Uh, and that's, what's the date on that? That's October something? It's coming up? October the 17th through the 20th. And we have a workshop, an all-day workshop, the Wednesday before. The, on the 16th, called the Skeptics Toolbox. Nice, nice, and that, that's a play on uh, Carl Sagan's. Oh yes, we shamelessly stole that, and yeah. uh, I think he'd be proud of us. I I think he would, and and so when does that start? On uh, that's the 16th. You said when does that start? In case someone wants to know more about that's it, that's a Wednesday, I believe. It starts at 10 in the morning and goes until the late afternoon. Okay, I will be getting there midday, late afternoon. Um, on Wednesday, so I can't do that. But uh, what is the website people can go to learn more about Wednesday and all the stuff over uh, the weekend? About Wednesday and the entire conference. Uh, the uh, conference website is sciconference.org. That's C-S-I conference.org. I'm typing it in right it's now. All the speakers, all the schedules, all the fun things you can sign up for. And and I'm waiting for it to load. I don't know why it's taking a second because the website is just that popular. Uh, whoa, sci-con.org? dot org. C S I. Oh my God! I Conference. Got, wow. Dot org. That explains. I Pay got attention. Something. Yeah. Well, that's good because the listeners get to hear it multiple times. So we C-S-I will just sci conference dot org. Yes. We'll just pretend like that is. Uh, what we wanted to do. And so why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, the conference and who's speaking and what's going on? You know, you were there last year, right? I was. Uh, You were. I remember you. And uh, to be honest, I did not think we could top last year. And I'm not just saying that to be buttering people up. But when Stephen Fry came down the elevator and I got to shake his hand, I just about lost it. That was last year. I didn't think we could top it. We have a lineup this year that's coming pretty darn close, I would say. Nice. Some really awesome people. I'm I'm looking at the list here now because I finally figured out how to type. Um, (laughs) And listeners, don't go to sci.com. I'm just saying it's not cool. Um, Who knows what's on that website? Well, anyone who's so curious that they, they, they now have to go. You have Brian Green. Brian Green, the best selling author. Theoretical physicist, which is a term that always scares me, but uh, he he presents science in such a way that even I can follow it. He, he, I'm really he excited about him. Does he has written many books, and I've read a couple of them, or I've, I've listened to someone read it to me through an audio book, uh, and also have oh, done many many uh, documentaries. I don't think I knew that. That's fantastic. Yeah, matter of fact, uh, the fabric of the. Cosmos, uh, I'm pretty sure they made a documentary about that book. Now, I don't know how much he was in it, but uh, um, hmm. yeah. So uh, we. I will have to check that out. Very yeah. good. And, unless I'm mistaken. Ugh. Well, why don't you tell me about uh, him and then Julia Sweeney while I Google to see how fucked up I just made that. <laughs> Julia Sweeney, Pat from SNL. I am so delighted. She's She just joined our board of directors is really exciting she um she's just marvelous she she sort of left uh, comedy behind on that sort of scale but has done some one women shows and books and fabulous things she's just marvelous i think everybody loves julia and i think wasn't she just have... on snl this last week for the uh the, the cold open with trump 
I saw that, but I didn't see her. But okay. I kind of missed it. Maybe, maybe. Who did she play, you think? Oh, my God. I don't know. I, I saw it and I was like, oh, my God, is that Julia Sweeney? Um, but I'd have to watch it again to see if I could figure it out. Okay. Let me know. Yeah. Let me know. So she's going to be there. And, and really, this goes for everybody, I think, pretty much. Um, a lot of people have formal book signings, but. Just about everybody is accessible. If you have a book by one of our speakers, just bring it and give them a smile, and they'll be happy to sign it for you, I'm sure. That That is fantastic. Uh, we also have, uh, who's this guy, Dawkins something? Robert, Robert Richard, Richard, that's yeah, right, Robert. Richard Dawkins, uh, of, of uh, science and atheism fame. Also a board member, of course, at the Center for Inquiry, and he's going to be speaking as well. He is truly one of the most approachable folks um, that we have around. He's just delightful and um, manages to to show up for us and and delight the crowds. And hey, are you a Star Trek guy? I, I love Star Trek and Star Wars. I, I I like them both. I can I can do that. Excellent. How about John DeLancey from The Next Generation? Is he coming back? He is going to be there, yeah. That That is nice. Now, he has also been very cool and uh, very approachable at conferences, so uh, people can enjoy that. Great. You know, I am the one, uh, there's two people I'm super, super excited about. One is Jen Gunter. Uh, she is an OBGYN and I think a pain specialist as well. Just an all-around amazing woman. Uh, and she has a new book out called The Vagina Bible. The Vagina Bible. I, the Vagina Bible. I am so totally getting that signed by her. Uh, she's going to talk and uh, she is always interesting and thought-provoking. She's fantastic. Jen Gunter. Remember the name. If you can make it to Psycon, check her out elsewhere. She is well, wonderful. Well, I do know that she is quite a regular Twitter person. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, um, boy, and does she... she does not mince... <laughs> she doesn't mince words, does she? I, uh, I remember someone uh, was trying to explain to her what a vagina was. <laughs> uh, and uh, she was trying to explain to them... And it basically got down to, uh, unfortunately, I don't know a better way to say it, but they, someone was trying to mansplain to her what yeah. a vagina was, and she, you know, whipped out the uh, the PhD and uh, you know years of experience, and that that is her specific area of study and research and focus, and probably you know one of the world's most preeminent experts on a vagina and other related parts. Um, and the person just could not stop themselves from trying to correct her, even after all this stuff. It was really, really pathetic. That takes a special kind of stupid, doesn't it? Well, either that or they're just intentionally trolling, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose. I, I, I'm, I'm scrolling through this, and I don't even know where to start. Let me let me go back to the top here. Um, we've got Banachek, um, Britt Marie Hermes. Yes, she is marvelous. Uh, she's also a science communicator. Have you seen her before? I don't believe I have, so that will be something new for me, which is good. That'll be new. We've got to have new stuff, new people. Did you notice uh, David David Mickelson? He's the co-founder of Snopes dot com. Ooh, I I hadn't got I that have... far down. That 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 is fantastic. He hadn't made it to the M's, David Mickelson. <laughs> I'm I'm really excited about him. He is. Uh, that's an interesting area, obviously. You are right. All of us have relied on Snopes for so many years. I didn't even realize this was an alphabetical. Oh, my God. How long is this list? Susan Gerbic, Jen Gunter, Gunter Ray Hall. I know Ray. Uh, Jeff Hawkins. Yep. Kurt Anderson, who wrote Fantasyland. Did which I, is an I... awesome book. And, of course, my, my very special colleague... Coven Synapathy, who is just all the way around amazing. She's a writer and journalist, and she co-hosts Point of Inquiry, which is our podcast. Put a little pitch in for that. Yeah. She's marvelous, so she'll be speaking. And I know I know Mark Edward, uh, mentalist, 
does great stuff. Yes. Susan Gerbic with Gorilla Skepticism. Um, yep. I'm, I'm she up does, to eight. She does great work. The, the skeptics um, owe her a huge debt of gratitude. And matter of fact, she was very kind, and, and someone from her group made me a Wikipedia page for me. Oh. Yeah, it lasted an hour. Wow, excellent. Yeah, it was up for an hour. Very good. Yeah, it was... But you know what you're seeing, and I think uh, I, the thing that has me excited about this year's Psycon is that we're really broadening the spectrum of the things we're talking about. So it's it's everything. Everybody will find a topic uh, of interest, you know, if it's climate change or... Um, if if you're encountering your strange uncle at Thanksgiving <laughs> who has some strange beliefs or, or or conspiracy theories, you know, how to deal with that. Um, we talk about our lawsuits against uh, the marketing of homeopathy in major stores like Walmart and CVS. Oh, yeah. The, just the, didn't you guys sue, sue somebody about that? He asks knowingly. Did, I think you had Nick on. I did your show talking yeah. about that didn't you yeah yeah uh and so if listeners aren't familiar uh center for inquiry has sued cvs for um, misleading consumers to thinking that homeopathic medicine or as i like to call it fake medicine although that word fake is thrown around so much now it's gotten blurry um medicine that cannot work uh i guess i won't even call it medicine it's stuff that cannot work and cvs sells it on shelves next to actual medicine and puts it in ads next to actual medicine and people can be innocently or um, not not so innocently led to believe that it's actually effective and does something when it can't so it's not you're right and 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 we're not about banning that stuff from the markets we're saying put it separately in its own section so that consumers who are interested in that can Pick it out, but the rest of us aren't confused by what's scientific and what's not. Well, and one of the most insidious ones that I've ever seen, I mean, you know, if you're an adult and you have a sore throat and you want to take some bullshit that doesn't do anything for your sore throat and waste your money, whatever. I, I guess I'm not too worried, you know, buyer beware kind of thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Although part of me is still conflicted. But when it comes to a little box for drops that you can put in your child's ear to help the ear infection symptoms. Mm. That's insidious because uh, a child could suffer permanent damage, hearing loss in one or both ears by not getting proper medical treatment. Um, and that should not be allowed, period. It is It is a tough sort of area for consumers to make good choices and we're we're wanting to make sure that they have the opportunity to make good choices and i see yeah. my good buddy jim underdown is going to be there jim he runs our uh, cfi west office in los angeles and uh as always he hosts our costume party on is it friday night no saturday night i think uh that's always a lot of fun yeah so i mean this is this is uh ama oh and uh Leanne Lord, a good friend of mine, is going to be there doing some comedy. Leanne is so funny. For for all, all your listeners who might think that we're going to be all brainy all the time, we do have some fun as well. <laughs> oh, did you see Piff the Magic Dragon I, is going to be there I with, did. I with saw his that. dog? That that is hysterical. I mean, and like I've said, you know, we've got the uh, workshop all day on Wednesday. You've got more mm -hmm. workshops on Thursday, and they end at four. And then, of course. For anyone who's listening at 4.15, we're going to meet right in front of your registration desk and we're going to go over and get burgers and alcohol and then we're going to come back at 7 o'clock, the opening reception. What What is Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire? That is Kurt Anderson's book. Okay. Uh, it came out, I want to say a couple of years ago. Fabulous read. Really interesting read all about how susceptible we are to magical thinking, basically. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Boy, I don't. Yeah. I know it. Oh, he's. I can't wait to see him. His book is fantastic. And I'm just. I'm just now. I'm scrolling through titles: fake news, uh, communication unsound, how the brain learns. Oh yeah, good stuff. Yeah. It so is good this stuff. this and it goes all the way until 
Sunday, the bookstore opening remarks. Oh, and the papers. I, I did one, not for you guys, but for uh, Tam, who used to have their conference in Vegas, mm-hmm. as I'm sure you are aware. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then the 50s party? When is When is that? Saturday. Yeah, it's a costume party that we have. Lots of dancing, lots of merriment. And if you would like to, you can uh, dress up like John Travolta or something. <laughs> it's a 50s theme this year, and I have poor poodle skirts, so I'm still working on a costume. Oh, my God. Yeah. We'll, we'll get something lined up. You know, you should come as a greaser. No one will expect that. <laughs> Just get a white white shirt well, and roll up a cigarette pack in your sleeve. Oh, there you go. You got it. That would be funny. So, again, everybody, go to... CSIconference.org. Don't misspell it like I did. CSIconference.org. You can see all the speakers, the schedule, uh, hotel information. And this is at the Flamingo? At the Flamingo in Las Vegas, yes, for the first time. This is our first time there, so I'm looking forward to that. Well, the nice thing about the Flamingo is it it's pretty, I mean, it's a little bit dated, as far as some of the other places, which is why it's so damned affordable. Um, but mm-hmm. it's really central. I mean, it is in the middle of the strip. Uh, so it is a fabulous location. If you're going to Vegas, you can do like I often do. You go a couple days early or you stay a couple days extra. And sometimes mm-hmm. you never know who shows up early and you might have private time in the lounge with somebody that you've been dying to meet. And it's just you and a couple other people. So I like doing that. It's a, I have had the best conversations with people just in the hallway of PsyCon. Yeah. It, it is just amazing. Everybody's super friendly and open to chatting, and um, it, it's fantastic. Well, it, it, I see a list here of different things that might come up. Anti-vax, climate science, psychics, homeopathy, flat earth, um, all kinds of fun stuff. And that flat earth thing, that that is the one... Actually, Flat Earth and 9-11, um, sometimes at atheist conferences, I wish the attendees, well, I think most of them are, but I wish more of the attendees were more formally educated in skepticism. Uh, that's a very important yeah. thing because every once in a while at a conference, at an atheist conference, I meet someone who is a 9-11 truther and it just drives me batty they, that they the way they process like you said magical thinking yeah and you know the, that's oftentimes what we talk about is how do you talk to somebody like that you can dismiss them and walk away or you can try and engage them and 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 chip away a little bit at possibly that that thinking and be one of many chips that finally break down to you know have them see reason I like it. So what else should we know about the conference or Center for Inquiry before we wrap up? Anything else we haven't really hit on? The the Center for Inquiry itself, if if any of your listeners have not heard of us, we've been around since 1980. We were founded by Paul Kurtz um, and uh, a number of other truly uh, remarkable folks, Um, like, for example... um, James Randi. James Randi, of course, and who else am I thinking about? The Cosmos. Carl Sagan. Oh, of course. Uh, the patent, patron saint, so to speak, Yeah. of critical thinking. So those are some of our founders, and it's amazing how far we've come. We really bridge everything from skepticism to humanism and everything in between. Uh, if it's something that needs to be inquired about, we look into it. And uh, it's a fun place to work. It's a fun place to be a part of. So I invite your listeners to check us out. Come I, to the conference. I say hi you. to me. Yeah. I'm I'm one of those uh, yeah persons who are who are everywhere, and uh, I'd love to meet everybody. I know you mentioned the Los Angeles office, but you yes. probably I don't know if you have them all memorized. Where where else do you have facilities? Uh, we have uh, volunteer groups all over the country, but we have actually staffed branches in, as I said, Los Angeles, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in Indianapolis, 
in Washington, D.C., in New York City. They're ramping back up some interesting things. So uh, we're, we're kind of all over the place. I like it. I like it. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I greatly appreciate it. And in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be hanging out together in Las Vegas. We will. It'll be a blast. And thanks again for being a sponsor. That's a huge thing. You know, we, we, we always, it's always nail biting time to see if we can, um, um, just pay the bills, pay the bills for these conferences. Um, and, and having a sponsor like you, it really makes a huge difference. Thank you. I, well, I really appreciate it. You're very it. kind. And it's one of the things that I, I hoped that in, in my fantasy world years ago, when I started this, that I could show other businesses that you can uh, make money by marketing to or promoting conferences. And it has worked way beyond my wildest fantasy. And I keep telling people that, but yet the other uh, advertisers and sponsors are few and far between. But hopefully we can change that and someday we can have something like Pepsi or Nike uh, with their logos on on the uh, the banners behind the stage. How's that sound? Wouldn't that be something? But in the meantime, we'll take Polaris Financial any day. I appreciate it. Martina, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Phil. Thanks so much for all you do for us. You bet. Have a good day. You're listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. I do hope you've enjoyed everything in the show so far. It has been a bit of a challenge to get it together so quickly after getting back. Uh, I had to do my quarterly billing. I only get paid once every three months, so have to get that done. And also a few people that uh, were kind enough to wait till I got back, had to talk to them. And I think I'm really close to caught up. And you might even hear in my voice, uh, if not this segment, the segments that I recorded earlier to blend in, got a little bit of a cold riding on those buses. So uh, trying to fight that off a little congestion. So forgive me for that. But I think that's about all we have. Uh, if you like the show, you can go to patreon.com slash fill. And you can contribute there, and I greatly appreciate it. You can also give us a five-star, us, me, I guess, a five-star review on Stitcher or in iTunes. That helps the show out quite a bit. And I hope to see you out there somewhere at a conference or out on the road. If you do see me, feel free to come up and say hello. Until then, ciao. Christian side hook, that 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 Christian side